Welcome back to Sports Blitz Live. Luke Robinson here with a guest we've had on the show before, the one that only feels still maybe the busiest man in America. Phil, how are you doing today? Hey, real good, Luke. How about yourself? Uh, doing fantastic. Finally getting some much-needed rain around here, and that's a good thing. But, Phil, when, I'm not kidding when I say you're probably the busiest man in America. I've, I've never seen anything like it. I Check out your Facebook page. Check out your web page as well. And, and you're on different radio shows and TV shows all the time. I have Sirius Radio in my car, and I listen to you on Rivals Radio or on 24-7 uh, Sports. And, and it's so much fun, and you certainly have a wealth of knowledge. There's no doubt about that. Well, I appreciate that, Luke. And, you know, it always seems to heat up a little bit once that uh, Major League Baseball All-Star break hits. I don't know if a lot of folks pay attention to the second half of the baseball season. And once that hits, everybody's starting to look towards football. And uh, I think today I'm doing about 13 radio shows. So it keeps me, keeps me off the streets. Yeah, that, that's a good thing. Well, listen, Phil, before we jump into college football, I want to ask you, I know you do an NFL magazine too. How difficult is it going to be to get an NFL magazine ready in time for the season, assuming we have one, considering all the tur turmoil that is going on in the NFL right now? Well, I think they will settle, and that's a good thing. I wish they would have settled about a week ago. It gave me a little bit more leeway. But as it looks right now, what's going to happen is uh, they'll be settled by July 21st, take about a week to get all the things fine-tuned to what's going to happen with free agency. Then there's going to be a five- to seven-day window for the free agents to sign. So now you're talking about the first couple of days of August. But once that hits, uh, all the free agents will be signed and in their proper places. Now, I think about 80% of the NFL magazines just decided to publish with the old information. We're holding out to the last minute. You're not going to see a Phil Steele on the newsstands until a couple of weeks prior to the NFL season. We have a lot of I's dotted and T's crossed. All the stats are checked, double-checked, schedules are in. We just have to get those free agent signings, and that's going to help the forecast. It's also going to help the individual sections, as we'll have the most updated material there. Uh, the newsstand window is going to be a lot smaller this year, but the advantage is we'll have information that's current, ready to go for the NFL season. The other guy is going to have information that was just post-draft and prior to whatever happens in free agency. So I think it will be a nice advantage to have. I think you're right, and I can't wait for NFL season. I'm one of those who – really appreciates the NFL game. I, I have a certain team that I pull for in college, but in the NFL, I just love to watch the train wreck every week. It's so much fun. But uh, moving over to the college game, we found out today Georgia Tech was hit with some NCAA penalties. Of course, North Carolina is under the microscope. West Virginia has been under the microscope. Everybody knows what's going on with Ohio State and USC. Auburn and Oregon, the two participants in the national championship game last year, they're certainly feeling a lot of heat right now. Are you disturbed by the trend of so many teams in NCAA hot water right now? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I think, you know, if you compare it to college football back in the 60s and 70s, it's a lot cleaner than it was then. The difference is right now everybody tweets, everybody's got Facebook, everybody's got camera phones. You're going to see a lot more stuff uncovered. I actually think – you know, some of the stuff they're uncovering uh, shows that they're on top of it. And, and, you know, there's not a lot going under the bridge where we don't see a lot of players that are getting cars. And I think what's the current situation is going to make those compliance offices for each of the NCAA teams uh, much more uh, looking for everything. They w they're going to want to make sure their team doesn't come under investigation in the future. So I actually think what happens this year is going to help college football in the long run because everybody's going to be looking at their own programs from the inside with a, uh, a more of a, a magnifying glass and making it cleaner all the way around. Okay, Phil, let's talk about a lot of SEC teams here as we are in the heart of SEC country. And I want to start off talking about South Carolina. We did a uh, projection here uh, for the Alexander City Outlook, the paper uh, here locally, and several of us got together and did our preseason predictions, and we all thought that South Carolina would win the East. Is that what you see happening? Uh, I have South Carolina second in the East, and I'll give you the reasons why. First of all, I think when you look at South Carolina, of the three teams in the East, if everybody had the same schedule, I probably would pick South Carolina as well. They've got the best running back receiver combo in the country in Marcus Lattimore and Alshon Jeffrey. They add in a Jadavian Clowney on the defensive line, giving them my number three rated defensive line in the country. Overall, they've got a top 10 deep. This is Steve Spurrier's best team by far that he's had in his seventh year. And of course, last year's team 
made it to the SEC title game. But I do think you have to factor in the schedule. And in the schedule, they have to play Georgia on the road. They also have to play Arkansas on the road. And those are two games I think they could be an underdog in. And I've got them dropping both of those games. And if that happens, I have them second in the SEC East. The team I actually have winning the East is a product of the schedule. And for those that think, you know, it's all about the talent on the field. It has nothing to do with the schedule. I say look at last year's Auburn. Auburn last year, uh, only number 21 in my power poll, but in the front of the magazine, in my Auburn forecast, I actually said Auburn could be 11-0 and when they traveled to face Alabama, and that was the case. They had the dream schedule. All the road games were easily winnable. The toughest games were at home. Or well, if you look at Georgia this year, look at their schedule. The three best teams in the SEC, I feel, are Alabama, LSU, and Arkansas. All three rank in my top eight of the power poll in the front of the magazine. Georgia has to play none of the three. They avoid Alabama, LSU, and Arkansas. And of the SEC East, they get South Carolina at home. Florida, while at a neutral site, normally Florida has a bye before the week before the game, and Georgia doesn't this year. They both have a bye the week before the game. And Florida's inexperienced. They only have 10 returning starters. They've got a first-year head coach. I think you add it all up. Georgia could very well win all eight SEC games. They're SEC road games. They have three of them, Tennessee, Vanderbilt, and Mississippi. All three had losing records last year. It's a Georgia team that ranks in my top units in all eight position categories in the front of the magazine, and they've got the dream schedule of the SEC East. That's why I went with Georgia 1 and South Carolina 2 in the East. Well, that's certainly music to Mark Rick's ears, who's got to be feeling a little bit warm on that seat in Georgia because if he doesn't produce relatively soon, things are going to get really hairy for him there in Athens. Now let's move over to the West for a second, and I want to talk about a team that you probably don't think I'm going here, but if South Carolina can win the East and do what they've done with, with their state's high school talent, why can't Ole Miss get over the hump? Is it just the level of competition in the West is so much stronger? What, what is the reasoning? Ole Miss, Vanderbilt, and Kentucky are the only three teams in the SEC that have not been to the championship game, and it's really astounding considering Ole Miss has somewhat of a history, at least a better history than South Carolina. Yeah, and I think uh, what we saw with Ole Miss is they nearly got there in 08 and 09. I think 09, their expectations were just a little too high, and they were definitely a disappointing team, as you recall. They came in number eight in the AP poll and finished number 20. They finished number 14 in the AP poll in 2008. So I think they have the opportunities to get there. You know, you might look at the the general scheme this year and say having to get past teams like Alabama, uh, LSU, Arkansas, Auburn on a yearly basis is difficult. But look at the SEC East. You know, uh, we had teams like Georgia and Florida and Tennessee that you had to get by. If you looked at the situation four years ago, you could throw those four names out, three names out, and said it was impossible to get past those three. And like you said, South Carolina did. I think Mississippi's got the potential to get there. Uh, They're going to surprise a few folks this year. They actually make my most improved list. I think they'll go from a losing record to a bowl game this year, probably a seven, possibly eight win season and surprise a lot of folks. But, uh, uh, it, it could be one of these years in the near future they could actually break through. Okay, so you talked about LSU, Alabama, and Arkansas being uh, three of your top eight teams, not in the SEC, but in the country. How far of a drop do you see Auburn's having, uh, considering they lost Cam Newton, obviously, and Nick Fairley? But somebody that a lot of people aren't talking about is losing Darvin Adams and then losing that most of that offensive line, which was incredible last year. Where do you see Auburn ending up? Yeah, and, you know, last year I had Auburn on my surprise team list in the front of the magazine, which was taking a team that was not going to be ranked in the top 10 in the start of the year. In fact, they opened the season number 22 in the AP poll and saying this team is a national title contender, and that's what I did with Auburn last year. And a lot of that was the product of two things, Uh, the experience level that they had. Last year they had 15 returning starters, plus got the addition of Cam Newton, a quarterback, who I thought was an upgrade at the QB position. The second thing was the schedule. As mentioned, you looked at their road slate last year, and all the road games fell into the winnable category, with the exception of Alabama, where you had to say that that's a game they're going to be an underdog in. They had all the tough games at home. Now, Auburn had a dream season. Not only did they have the schedule and the experience in their favor, they also won a lot of close games. I mean, you look at the uh, Clemson game, the drop touchdown pass at the end, Mississippi State was a three-point win. South Carolina, they trailed. 
Uh, Kentucky, they needed a touchdown at the end to pull out the win. A lot of close games where basically if you change one play of the game, they could easily have lost seven net close wins last year. All those factors, plus the fact the schedule gets a lot more difficult this year, have them pointed downward in a big direction. You look at road games this season against Clemson, South Carolina, Arkansas, LSU, and Georgia. I think they're going to be an underdog in all five of those games. They also have to host Alabama and host Florida. Now, in Vegas right now, they're actually an underdog in all seven of those games heading into the season. I don't think it's going to be that bad. I do like the talent that they have on hand. But I can actually see them getting a six or possibly seven win season. And while I have them going to a bowl game, I'm sure Auburn fans aren't too happy. I project them to the BBVA Compass Bowl this year uh, to take on Cincinnati. Well, uh, again, it's, it's going to be a drop. I think everybody, uh, even in this area, has to admit that. I mean, Auburn lost a lot, probably lost as much as anybody has lost in the last several years. But if, you, if they can make a bowl game considering that schedule and considering the depth of the SEC this year, I think that most Auburn fans will take that right now. How long is it uh, going to take – I'm sorry, Phil, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, as far as experience level goes, six returning starters, they rank number 120 in my experience level wow. in the country this year. So they're at the very bottom. I was going to say, and that's out of 120, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Phil, how long is it going to take Florida – to come back or at least be up there with the national elite again. They have a brand new coach in Will Muschamp. Uh, they have a new offensive coordinator in Charlie Weiss, who really I'm not that fired up about. I'm sure a lot of people out there are, maybe some Gator fans, but I saw enough of him at Notre Dame to know I'm not real fired up about his taking the, the reins there as the offensive coordinator in Gainesville. Is Florida uh, on the fast track back, or do you think it'll be a slow process? 